I have the unique pleasure of introducing another longtime friend of mine and a longtime friend of all of ours here at uh, Tour. Uh, started the day with a longtime friend and closing out the day with a longtime friend, so it makes a wonderful set of bookends, makes me really happy. Uh, we've got Matrix here talking about data security, how to avoid an embarrassing breach, so please welcome him to the final talk of the day. All right, so I have basically worked in information security for over 15 years. I've done quite a few interesting things in regard to incident response. Uh, I basically have presented at Torcon and uh, Torcon Seattle and DerbyCon and Layer One, all the good ones. So essentially, I'm glad to have been uh, selected to be the alternate. This talk is eventually going to go ahead and cover data. And a lot of people don't actually think about data as far as how we handle it, uh, how expansive it is, and things like that. So we're going to cover the history of data security, the way we used to do things and why we used to do them the way that we used to do them, uh, a data security life cycle, data classification, and types of data that actually exist. So questions are usually brought up. I actually get paid quite a lot to go ahead and solve these issues. And uh, how do I solve it? There are elements of data security. There are elements in actually all of information security, which would be people, process, and technology. So I will also cover the industry standards. We will do some threat modeling, the tabletop exercises, and talk about architecture. So why would we need data security? Essentially, a lot of people have now started thinking about data security due to privacy laws. GDPR, uh, if you guys haven't been paying attention, those are all the emails that you've been spammed. The thing is, is it actually does have some meat behind it in the fact that it wants certain data types actually categorized, cataloged, and able to be uh, essentially dealt with. So if I'm a European citizen, if I want my data deleted, I can go ahead and have that data deleted. If I'm a European citizen and you gave my data to a third party, I can ask who you gave my data to. So in general, knowing what type of data you have and how to catalog it is pretty good, but this is not that talk. So it's kind of bad because we all use acronyms and nobody knows what the hell is going on. As far as these things, here's some real fun ones. DAR, DIM, DLP, UBA, PHI, PII, IP. You're going to know more. <laughs> DAR, data at rest. DIM, data in motion. DLP, data loss prevention. UBA. This UBA is actually supposedly the new hotness when you go ahead and implement it. It's user behavioral analysis, which uses AI and machine learning, which we know doesn't really work that well. But essentially what it's supposed to do is it's supposed to work in tandem with user intent. So if I'm stealing all your documents, essentially, if it's a part of my normal business process and it's a business process that's broken, it will attempt to go ahead and if I stick a USB in there and I'm starting to take the secret formula for Coke, that should never happen. So it's going to actually say, what is this document? What is this user doing with this document? Are they actually supposed to have access to it? And if not, 
it's going to go ahead and kick off flags and somebody should be able to respond to it. Uh, PHI is protected health information. PII is personally identifiable information. And then we have intellectual property IP. So if we go way, 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 way back, the internet, ARPANET, essentially, it was only a concept in 1969. Nobody thought that we were going to have the clued, the internet, the internet what's and all that stuff. ARPANET changed to DARPANET and back again. So we could actually go ahead and spread data with interconnectivity to increase research. Uh, we kind of also shot ourselves in the foot with that because now everything as far as data moves around. When we ended World War II, we actually had a Cold War, which was a lot of research and development. And since we could actually transfer this data back and forth, we needed to go ahead and figure out how to prevent the leakage of the secret to our missiles, our space program, and everything else. If you are a CS, CISSP and you pass the exam, you actually should know what I'm going to go ahead and show. If you got it and you still don't get it, I feel sorry because then it is really a mill. So there are two types of uh, models that existed. So the BIBA model was developed in 1975, specifically to go ahead and prevent corruption of data. Uh, corruption of data is essentially the integrity of it, and it is in a read up and write down manner. So essentially you can only create content at or below the integrity level so think about it as you have the hierarchy of monks and only the, the top, top priest can go ahead and write the scriptures and the interns can only read it. They can't write it. So you're protecting the integrity of data by making sure only the highest authority writes the data. The next methodology is basically the bell Apadula model in 1972. And these actually go back and forth and contradict one another. So this one is called write up, read down. So you take your average ordinary office worker and they're going to go ahead and build something. And what it is is I have office clerks who get news feeds, they basically write it, and essentially the way that the data is protected is it's only at your level. So think of it as you're a scientist creating something for the space program. You can create the top secret files, but you can't create the public files in the sense of you wrote it, a person who has higher clearance than you can go ahead and read down. A general can definitely go ahead and read down so that they actually have the specifics as to the data. But if I am not in a classified area or have the clearance to go ahead and access that data, I cannot actually access the data. So we built machines back in the 80s specifically to have MLS, which is multi-level security. We don't actually have machines capable of doing that with this built in. So what that means is my particular box, a mainframe or an AS400 or something that was built during the Cold War, essentially 
have different security levels. So the IBM AS400, which is now the I-series, uh, essentially still has those Cold War controls in it. A lot of people don't turn them on, unfortunately. So if I turn a I-series AS400 platform into a level four, it is going to strictly enforce the database so that if you do not have the proper clearance, you actually cannot access the data. So it follows that, that model, the word, the write up and read down. So whatever level you are, you basically write it, you have access to it, and people higher than your level can read it. So the thing of it is, is these were designed back in the day, once again, during the Cold War, and essentially memory is protected, memory space is protected, databases were segmented, you could have multi-tenant things on there and be assured that unless you had the proper clearance level, it wasn't going to happen. And uh, Spectre and Meltdown would not be a thing in this environment. So it's kind of funny because Sea Dragon, awesome guy, awesome friend. It's like uh, his uh, Twitter has given up on sanity and have decided I'm going to retire to a nice AS400 somewhere in New Zealand when it's time to unplug. <laughs> so, in other words, he's saying, I want to go to a very, very, very secure environment and I want to be segmented and only people who need to have access to me can have that access. So, also, we had things back in the day as far as data custodian roles. We have gone ahead and pretty much gotten rid of that because it's a cost center. So who here remembers a large green bar paper? Yeah, that, that was the way you used to get things. You didn't get an actual database extract. You didn't get anything. If you were lucky and it was approved, a data custodian would print out all your data and then you would get a big, big green bar sheet. And that's the way that it was. And gee, there were no breaches back then. <laughs> so the other thing is, is backups were a part of this role. So Spectre and Meltdown, or ransomware, rather ransomware, if you lost all your stuff, this was the guy's job. He basically protects the data. So he validates that backups are done. He validates that people with the proper access levels to the backups get the data back and essentially ensured that uh, any of the data that was stored never went bad and it's correct. We don't do this anymore. We have fast business. Let's throw it in the clude. Let's uh, give it to everyone. Let's set up uh, Hadoop to throw our data everywhere, even though it's unsanitized. We have no idea what that data is. So given the fact that we've moved to the fast business model, it requires that we have all the things, let's have all the data, all the time, everywhere, we don't care what it is. And that's why I said the GDPR thing, that's kinda gonna have to change things for people because you can't put that type of data anywhere and not know where it is. So, hey, why don't we go ahead and uh, give an API rights to the entire database? Yeah, that's happened, that's a breach. Uh, let's take a mainframe environment or an AS400 environment, which is pretty locked down and you don't actually get access to it, and just uh, throw it everywhere. Or even worse, hey, that public bucket, that's three. It's just data, let's move it there. That's happened. We now interrupt this talk to ask, why the hell would you do that? Why is 
Viz would flail his arms. So we brought virtual Viz. Yeah, I think you're cutting out. All right, the battery might be dying. All right, so what changed? Why did we go ahead and have the advent of breaches? Yeah, we got internet, we got email. Let's go ahead and take the formula to Coke and email it to the marketing team. Great, we got cloud instances like the S3 buckets. We've got laptop computers that could actually be encrypted, but I find it very, very, very highly unlikely because most people don't have the maturity to even have a proper image on a laptop computer. We've got people who store them on their phone, and then that goes to iCloud. We, then we got Dropbox, mass storage, the size of your fingernail, your smallest fingernail, and of course, internet of shit. All right, so going back to the way that data should be protected, and for all the CISSPs, you already know that they changed it to the AIC triad. It's more politically correct. So you have this triad, and it's a triangle, and what you should be thinking about as far as your data is, one, availability. Is it always accessible to me as a business or an individual because I need that data? I need confidentiality. When I have this data, are the right people accessing it? Am I giving it away? Is it in the public cloud? And then you need to have the last triad of integrity. Is my data correct? So going back to the two models that I had previously talked about, you have the confidentiality part, which is the read up, write down, and then you have the BIBA model for integrity. So essentially, what is the attack vector for confidentiality? Exfiltration and other people who should not be accessing that data. What is the integrity? Well, we can't go ahead and change your FICO score just because we want to. And what is the availability? I got to be able to access my data every time, all the time. So, this is a data security life cycle. There are a couple of things that I feel are missing as far as it. So when you work with data, essentially it starts at the create area and then it's stored, then it's used and it needs to be shared and then archived and most importantly destroyed. So when I go into a client, the first thing I usually ask them is, okay, I need to see what your standards and policies are. And they usually go, these, and they're so poorly written that they don't really have a chance in hell in actually going ahead and fixing it. So the first thing I wanna go ahead and do is look at what I can destroy. And that's going to be retention. So once again, you can't exfil what ain't around. If you delete it, yeah, can't take it. The thing of it is, is uh, we need to go ahead and destroy data and not be afraid to go ahead and delete it. Uh, there are regulatory things, like if you're in a bank, you have to keep data for seven years. I'm kind of stuck on that seven years. It's not changeable whatsoever. Uh, if I'm in certain government places, I have to keep data for up to 14 years. But you should make sure that when you have this talk, you make sure that uh, you do have a 
retention policy that will go ahead and uh, ensure that uh, you don't have any issues with retention. I would say your most dangerous person in your organization are data hoarders. Uh, ask Sony how uh, those unencrypted PST files help them a lot or embarrass them a lot. That was really, really, really bad and it had nothing to even do with actual business things. Personal emails leaked. So data hoarders are dangerous and people can't steal what's deleted. So essentially, let's say I'm an R&D house or I'm designing things and I have intellectual property. I need these old designs to design things better. I can't actually go ahead and destroy them. So this is where we talk about the actual archive area and essentially what do we see people making mistakes on every time they archive them? They don't know what they actually were backing up to begin with. So it is important that you reconsider things as far as basically making it harder for your attacker. So you can go ahead and solve this one of two ways. You can encrypt all the archives or backups, or you can use rights management. And essentially, even if that data is exfilled, it's pretty useless. So backups aren't even a part of that, that little circle thing that I actually showed you. And now, even more than ever now, it's going to be much more important because a whole city, the city of Atlanta, essentially lost their whole infrastructure and didn't have any backups. And the backups that they did have were about five years too old, so that was pretty much disastrous. So, once again, we need to ensure that uh, backups actually work. And if they go missing on a truck that went to the something mountain place, uh, they should be encrypted or all the good stuff should have rights management. So once again, even if I'm hit with uh, ransomware, I still am operational. At least I can come back within a day or 48 hours worth. I don't know of any, of too many organizations who have actually not lost more than two weeks worth of work. So that's something you wanna actually look at in your organization. On average, when I've done incident response and we've had to take machines offline, it's usually about a month's worth of data that was behind because we can't actually go ahead and take something off production. So things you can go ahead and do to make sure is that you run systems in parallel to do high availability and at least have those warm transfers. Databases are the absolute horriblest ones to try and do because there's just too many transactions. And the only thing I suggest in those things are to actually run two databases in hot swappable HA and all the databases are correct and you encrypt the hell out of it and essentially monitor the actual tables that you actually understand to be very sensitive. So data classification, we go back to that little circle thing and it's the actual create mode. So which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, you created the file. What are you going to go ahead and do as far as deal with it? I suggest that by the time you create a file, you should actually go ahead and classify the data. Reasons are, you don't have the excuse of, I didn't know what data I was dealing with. So 
I didn't know I wasn't supposed to send the, the stuff out. Other technologies actually rely on this. So I was talking about UBA, which is the user behavioral analysis, as well as data loss prevention. They suck. You cannot actually get any of the, the data loss prevention or UBA things to actually work. It's not going to happen. Uh, once again, magical AI and machine learning, it just doesn't do it. The other thing is, is I can't turn on DLP to actually be in active block mode because there's too much critical things that may go out. So if I block an executive from doing, a sales guy from actually doing the million dollar deal because he actually had to send out stuff that we approved, yeah, I'm probably gonna be fired if I block that. But if we actually go ahead and have classification with meta tags, that actual AI and machine learning can actually take the real meta tag and go, this is classified at this person's level. Once again, the read up, write down. They are authorized to send it to X, Y, Z. This is a normal part of their business process. I don't care it's three o'clock in the morning, it's an email, it's going out. They're cleared to do this type of thing. That's a proper way to actually have a monitor mode and actually have audit. It's better to actually go ahead and block than it is to actually attempt to just do monitor mode, your sock will never catch it. All that data will be exfilled. We've done all kinds of interesting things to solve these solutions. We've done, hey, if you see 500 credit cards, block it. Credit cards are super easy to go ahead and do because we have a loon algorithm. What about all the states, different states, Driver's license. A New York driver's license cannot be done via Loon. It doesn't have a pattern. It's all over the damn place. So if I have a thousand New York driver's license go out, they will go out. And I'm going to let it go out, but, or I'm going to be blocking everything. It's just not very elegant. So I highly recommend that you look into some type of data classification to actually tag and use metadata for the actual uh, document upon creation. They're very, very, very good ones. So somebody asked me once to go ahead and explain how this all works. So data classification, we have a single file. That little drop, single file, not a problem. Petabytes. Fuck, I can't even. So, from drop to flood, where the hell does it go? So I walk into a organization, they have EMCs, they have everything. They have petabytes, hundreds of terabytes of data. They ask me, hey, I need you to find all the PII. Can you tell me where the PII is? And I'm like, uh, no. So you have to start somewhere. So to solve these problems, what I actually go ahead and do is I usually implement data classification, start meta tagging things, and since I know data is like water, the drops are going to actually follow the rest of the flood. So once I've actually gone ahead and tagged it, I start looking for what I tagged. And if I found some good stuff, I'm guaranteed to go ahead and find where the rest of it is instead of actually trying to actually scan the entire petabyte because I can't do enough distributed computing. And especially if it's a database to go scan a database, that would take it down. I can't do that because they're going to say, oh, you need to scan the database. You can only do it every window, but that will affect my backups and then you can't do it. So what I like to do is, as I said, make sure you tag it and then just start following it and you're definitely guaranteed to go ahead and find it. So the benefits of actually doing data 
classification as an exercise implementing a technology are, one, I know what to go ahead and back up. I know how recent these things are. So if I actually start doing the metadata tags, I can go ahead and say, show me all the things that were tagged that have confidential information and start backing that up. I know I need to back that up. It also shows me a date that it was last accessed and last touched. Uh, once again, that discovery thing I was talking about, find me all my data, I just follow the rest of the data. You can then go ahead and consider smarter security architecture in the fact that nobody does defense in depth right because they're trying to defend all things. Uh, as I was talking about, to help along the machine learning and AI, I have to rely on those meta tags. Uh, if I want to do rights management correctly and make sure that I properly lock down particular files that contain things that I need, hey, I can prove that it was done because of data classification and I get a general situational awareness. Now, I will say, if you do choose a vendor who does data classification, you need to have a vendor that will actually go ahead and watch the state of the file from cradle to grave. So I create a document. It may be an Excel spreadsheet. I may have first names and last names. Nobody cares about that. That's cool. But then I give it to Gio. He adds telephone numbers in there. And then I give it to another guy. Oh, we have their social security numbers in that Excel spreadsheet now. Your particular data classification software should actually start noticing that this document has been changed. It wasn't sensitive. It wasn't confidential. And oh, crap. Now we have SSNs, first names, last names. It needs to retag that as actually a sensitive classification. All right, so we have types of data. There's structured data. This is the easiest to deal with. Structured data is essentially all your databases. Uh, all your AS400 systems run databases and actually control the tables. A lot of customers ask me to do the wrong thing. All my good stuff is in the database. I need to go ahead and protect this. Yes, we know you need to go ahead and protect this. Uh, but uh, databases were inherently built to be pretty secure in most situations as they've been around forever and most designs came from the earlier designs that I was talking about unless people actually run SA. <laughs> So, the one that's the hardest, unstructured data, anything that you can create on one of these personal machines. So, we've got Hadoop databases, we've got pictures, we've got source code. Source code is damn near impossible to detect, and I would never ever try and even do any data loss prevention at all without using tagging, because when you use data loss prevention and you actually try and use the algorithm for source code, which is crap, it usually is done on an endpoint and essentially it causes your developers too much grief and they can't get their work done. But if I have a tag that I can look for on the network, the, the classified tag, I can actually find that source code real quick. So, how do I solve this? I talked about the people, the processes, and technology. First thing I usually have to do when I go to a customer is figure out who's in charge of all this stuff. Usually it's been some IT security manager who's been tasked with, well, they told me I have to do this stuff. And I usually go, all right, so who's cutting the check for me to be here? 
Okay, let's go ahead and talk to those people. All right, so your boss wanted you to do this. Uh, we're going to need more than your boss. We need legal, we need HR, we need everybody. So we start with how much of a budget do you actually have to do this with? And I'm going to have to figure out how to go ahead and phase this. Usually it's going to be you're not mature enough to even monitor things in the SOC. Yeah, let's try data classification. It actually usually works pretty well, and then the organization in itself becomes aware of the fact that we have more data that was sensitive than we think. Then I've got legal and HR to go ahead and talk about the policies and the standards. And then, of course, enforcement if you actually are stealing from the company. So, once again, it's all people in an organization that use any of these data protection products, data classification, you have to get them to actively participate. If you get your people who are creating these things to actually tag these things really accurate, my actual classification software can actually start noticing the patterns of what is truly classified and actually start auto-correcting and auto-tagging based on the content that you're actually putting in. Processes. Well, I've got to educate all the users as far as data classification. I've also introduced a brand new tool into their environment to go ahead and tag this. So the effective ones, as far as products, use plugins. And when you're creating a document, it literally makes you the first thing I do before I can even save is, what type of document is this? How do I classify this? I would recommend highly that that product that you get force the person to actually think about what it is. So when you save the document, it won't actually save. Uh, you then have to go ahead and match all the technology with your processes. So any of these processes, the processes are controls. When I was talking about standards and policies, those should be published on your company intranet. Everybody should actually know about that. And there is no excuse to not know what they are. If there is, then they need to be referred to it and taught. And one of the other things is the actual enforcement, which is I need HR and legal to actually, if somebody's purposely sticking things on USBs and I have proof that they are and they're not supposed to handle that data, you need to go. You can't work for me anymore. So, Brian Krebs is not a DLP solution. Don't use him unless you just essentially use things in monitor. So, for technology, there are things in the stack that you can go ahead and throw in there. Uh, for data classification and metadata tagging, uh, there's e-discovery tools, data loss prevention, uh, CASB, rights management, public key infrastructure, encryption, and database access monitoring and firewall. I am not actually going to go ahead and name vendors because I'm not pitching anybody and I really don't care to do this in a talk. But no matter what I buy, none of this shit is going to work if you leave these tools in monitor mode and you don't invest the time to actually tune them. So. Don't waste your money, don't waste your time, don't buy any of this crap if you're not gonna actually invest time to actually make this work. All right, so, if you actually wanted to go ahead and research this more, there is something called the CMMI data maturity model. I do not, I do not recommend this to organizations uh, because you have to be able to crawl before you can walk, but supposedly this uh, data maturity model 
is what good looks like. If you want to see what it looks like, it's definitely a thing to aspire to do. I don't know anybody who hasn't been like PCI, QSA, not actually go through the correct controls, they just checkbox. It's sad and it doesn't work. But it is, it looks nice, it's pretty. <laughs> so what could go wrong? Uh, let's go ahead and switch to other things. I gotta love the new stuff. I'm on 38. This happened in the last presentation. PowerPoint essentially changed itself to, to not focus, and I'm using PDFs for other things. So, oops. All right, so I had to do this exercise with a place that actually had intellectual property, and they didn't actually understand uh, how data security worked, and they didn't understand why it would be of any value to them. In fact, some of them were developers and absolutely wanted me to do this in a waterfall thing, and I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? So I did a waterfall diagram. In any case, what I had to go ahead and do is break it down to stupid things. So we were doing the uh, data maturity model, so I had to cover each thing. So you look at the top, it's risk. What most of us care about, being the people that we are in InfoSec, just go straight to threat model and vector. So the threat model for cloud risk reduction is I'm unable to go ahead and provide legal hold materials because I don't know what, what data I have. So guess what? If I don't know where the data is and somebody puts a legal hold on me, they can say that whole server is on legal hold. I am so screwed if I have things there that shouldn't be there. Uh, I'm also unable to comply with regulatory requirements such as GDPR which is, what did you do with my data? Did you delete it? Where did it go? So to go ahead and actually tell the people why this is an important thing, how I'm going to go ahead and reduce risk other than use the data maturity model. Essentially, if I put in some type of e-discovery based on what I had put together on data classification, I should be able to have an accurate data inventory of what it is that is on that machine. I will know whether it is in scope and can talk to my legal department and say, absolutely not, you may not put this on legal hold because it has nothing to do with what we were doing. Data exfiltration. Uh, once again, what I don't have on my servers can't be stolen, but GDPR is absolutely funny because they want us to tell you exactly what was stolen in 72 hours in the event of a breach. I can't, there, there, there are no companies that I know that even know what assets were hit in 72 hours, let alone can tell you, oh, this, this, this over here, it contained SSNs and pictures and IP addresses. And, and yeah, it was breached. I've never ever seen anybody who could do that, ever. So once again, a threat model, backups that have not been verified. How do I reduce the risk and why do I want to reduce risk? Well, if I have good backups, essentially I can reduce risk by making sure that ransomware hits, I'm not affected for 
48 hours of loss. Uh, RM minus RF. Somebody deleted everything by accident. Eh, we're good. Uh, that's happened where people just accidentally deleted everything that they were supposed to to actually have left. All right, so let's go back to the slideshow. So those were the few tabletop exercises. You should be thinking about this in ways that you can explain to when you threat model. You should have in mind three different audiences. They're going to be the execs who I need to get my crayons out for. They're going to be the technical people who will go ahead and implement this, but they have no reason why they're going to implement this and how the, it should be implemented. So if you're doing a good job, you should actually have the controls and then you put technology in place to actually abide by those controls. So hackers want crown jewels. How do I protect them? Well, I need to know where they are. You need to go ahead and essentially have parameters. So if I know that my databases have all the good stuff and I know that a few file servers have what it is that I want, I need to define my defenses around it. Uh, back when I was talking about the way that computers were designed earlier, there was a thing called MAC, Mandatory Access Control. Essentially, that data never ever left, ever. And you can actually go ahead and download or, or do some more research about mandatory access control. Those particular computers are still around. And when SE Linux was actually put together a long time ago, you could actually turn that on. Uh, that hadn't been around in quite some time. Uh, another thing that you can go ahead and do is I would say anybody holding sensitive data, you could actually go ahead and risk model the user. If this guy has access to my sensitive data all the time, then if he's failing the phishing uh, internal attacks, yeah, straight to VDI to you. You don't get to go ahead and even uh, access anything with important data. But once again, that goes back to the classification. I need to know where my good stuff is. Don't be afraid to go ahead and find leaks by using Honeydocs. Uh, I purposely want to know where things are being egressed to. Uh, that Honeydoc essentially gives me a callback and gives me an IP address. Uh, another company is out there, and they were very controversial because not only did they do the beacon, they actually did a NatCat callback. You can buy those things, but I'm not going to go into that. Encrypt your data. Use PKI. Uh, make sure all of the things that you put in your stack are not in monitor mode. And essentially, if I have to go ahead and transport data from one country to another, I need to ensure that I know what type of risk that data has with it. And essentially, if I have to have my data leave the environment and essentially move from one place to another, I need that stuff classified, and I need that stuff under rights management or encrypted. So going back to the sensitive data people, yeah, you fail the phishing attempt. You get to use VDI, and that's all you use. Uh, that's basically it. And uh, there is no bar here, but uh, if you have questions, go ahead. Yes. Have you worked with any companies on limiting their creation of data? Have I worked with any companies on limiting their creation of data? No, I have not. 
Uh, in most cases, it's going to be a retention issue that I actually have to start deleting things. Uh, I would like to do that, but once again, that's just not how things work. Well, I would love to say, if you don't need to make it, don't make it, but we also run things in that fast business pace where it's like first to market and stupidity and yeah, I'm gonna save everything or hoard everything. So pretty much, so, so once again, data hoarders are my most dangerous adversary to my, my client or company or things like that. Yes? So that's another thing that I actually blew by. And supposedly the only pure way to go ahead and deal with this. So we were taught, he asked the question of how do I deal with data that now has become sensitive and could go ahead and reveal something. Let's just say a health thing that I don't want revealed got into that spreadsheet and I can't actually divulge that. How do I make that anonymous? That's through a, the only proper way to do it is using a technology called tokenization. So you have to go ahead and find some type of a technology that will actually assign some other value that cannot be associated with the first value and that's tokenization. Which a lot of things are being done for GDPR right now, but you have to be very careful because once again, keys are created and a legend is created for that tokenization. So if you have the actual master list of all that stuff, even though I've pseudo anonymized it by tokenization, it's not anonymous. So people make that mistake too. All right, I think I'm out of time. And uh, yeah, come and see me if you want to, anytime. And uh, just to be clear, there are actually at least one bar and a speakeasy sitting somewhere on camp. But uh, uh, Metrics can take questions where he wants. Uh, thank you for filling in for us. Uh, again, the talk that we had here originally will be Saturday at 3 on the Maker stage. Um, so if you want to catch that, it's been moved. It should be already updated on the schedules that are on the monitor. Um, and if you uh, know someone or uh, as an icebreaker tonight, introduce yourself and say, hey, do you own a Subaru from Oregon or a gray BMW from Washington? They're in the long-term parking. We need them moved. Um, <laughs> don't, uh, don't set things on fire. If you have cigarettes, be respectful and put them out in a proper place, the ground. <laughs> yeah, we have the the um, butt buckets sitting around. Uh, put them in there, and uh, no amplified music after 10 p.m. And have a great time tonight, everyone. Thank you for showing up for the first day. That's the end of the first day's worth of talks. Thank you. Yay.